Thank you for having me, Dr. Life Tadek. Happy to be here. This evening, I'll be just shedding light on erectile dysfunction, what a patient or an individual needs to know about erectile dysfunction. Um, I'm Dr. Adi Marshall. I'm a urologist. I'll be throwing light on it. All right, here we go. All right, thank you. Yes, uh, we've titled this discussion, Why Your Penis Is Not Working. I'm sure we all have an idea of what we meant when we say your penis not working. Definitely not for passing urine, um, it's for sexual function. We're talking about the sexual function. I'll use this outline to make the discussion a bit focused and more, um, and, uh, more enlightening. So I'll define erectile dysfunction as the inability to get or keep an erection for satisfactory sexual activity. Now this um, has three components. Is the patient or the person able to have quality erection? Is this erection able to, um, is the patient able to sustain this erection and also have satisfaction from the sexual activity? Occasionally, it will also be a regular thing. Um, however, it becomes, um, you need to see a urologist see if this is persistent for up to six months. What is the erection? The erection is just, um, again, we call that two mistakes. What and how does it come about? There's the anatomical and the physiological aspect of um, an erection. Um, the penis is the organ which gets erect once a sexual arousal. Um, be composed of at least three erectile tissues. And I'll try to demonstrate, I'll try to demonstrate that on the slides, if you see that. So the cursor is on the two, um, what we call the corporal cavernosa. They are the main erectile tissues. They are the tissue, the spongy tissues that fill up with blood. Once sexual arousal, um, once a sexual arousal and um, cause erection. The third one, which is down below, is the corpus spongiosum. It also fills up, but because it is not um, surrounded by a thick, um, thin fascia called the tunica albuginea, once blood fills into this other two, the pressure in them becomes very high and the, they become very turgid. However, this third one doesn't have that same um, complete covering of the albuginea and um, there are some struts that uh, connect from one side of the abuginia to the other. Those are not um, visible on this um, picture, but they connect as I can, I'm demonstrating with the cursor. They connect this way. So the elasticity of this issue is not um, infinite and that increases the pressure. Um, this stays a bit flaccid so that semen can pass during ejaculation. Um, now, the physiology of erection um, involves both physical, hormonal, and psychological elements. Once um, an individual is aroused, either from any source of arousal, which may be tactile, from sense of touch, vision, memory, um, smell, and even um, audi um, auditory uh, stimulus, the patient, the person gets um, um, an arousal and that sends signals from the brain down through the nerves, which will send um, secondary messengers to the penis, allowing increased blood flow into the penis and reduced blood flow out of the penis. Now, all this is, um, all this is controlled by the hormonal, the hormones, which the male hormones is um, serum testosterone. Um, the psychological element is what I've just described to be part of the arousal, which may be tactile, vision, auditory. And once the psychological elements, any of these elements is affected, then this patient or this person could begin to have um, 
experience some weak erection or erection that is not satisfactory. Uh, so what are the types of erections that the male has? There are three types. The first is the genitally stimulated one, also referred to as um, reflexogenic erection. Um, this is when the gen genitals, the penis, is um, touched. And that's um, why um, can be touched, whatever touch causes um, erect, um, stimulus in the penis and cause some reflexogenic erection. That doesn't really get to the brain. It's, the signals just go all the way to the spinal cord and come back and synapse back on the penis. Uh, so the patient doesn't completely have um, a, a grasp over that. He would say, oh, I can stop this. Um, centrally stimulated erection is uh, now that is from the brain. Uh, what has the person seen? What is the person remembering? What smells is the person um, perceiving? What sounds uh, uh, are causing arousal in this patient? And, and this centrally stimulated or central stimulus, very different in different people. What one person sees and will cause um, some form of erection. Is different from what the other person will, what the guy will see. Um, also, this is also, you know, modulated by our upbringing, modulated by our religion, modulated by our, um, our social, um, social, social status and uh, the culture in which we grew up and what is the cultural, um, what's the cultural outlook to sexual intercourse. All this modify. Um, this psychogenic um, psychogenic um, erection. In fact, even the media modifies this um, centrally stimulated psychogenic um, uh, erection. The media would tend to, you know, control what we perceive as being sex, what we, um, uh, the partners we perceive as being foxy, you know. So, the more of the media you imbibe, you know, the more that's going to also affect um, what will cause um, a centrally stimulated um, erection in a patient or in a person. Now, the centrally originated erection, again, the patient doesn't have much control over this. This happens when the patient is in a deep sleep, what we call the rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, and this is also more of um, a, a reflex. Hence why you find that men wake up with a, um, a stiff penis in the morning. So that's the centrally originated uh, penis. Even when the man has not had any sexually oriented, um, sexually oriented uh, dreams, we still wake up with this uh, uh, centrally originated erectile um, erection. Uh, erectile dysfunction is classified into three major groups. The psychogenic, which means, oh, there's no physical reason or no disease entity that one can hold on to and say, this is why this patient is having a poor erection. Um, psychogenic, basically. Organic means, yes, there's a problem. This patient has uh, some form of illness that's affecting either the brain or it's affecting the nervous system, is affecting the hormones, or there are problems with the cardiovascular, which is the heart and the, um, the heart and the blood vessels that uh, will bring blood to the penis. Uh, so those are called organic. Then there's the mixed type, which involves both psychogenic and organic. Oftentimes, you don't know, the, uh, oftentimes it starts with an organic cause, and then because the patient is having some poor erection, sex, sexual activities are not satisfactory, the patient then begins to have some psychogenic um, Causes also because patient then begins to lose self confidence, begins to dread having sex, starts having um, reasons or giving excuses to the partner why he cannot or or why he cannot uh, doesn't want to have sexual um, relations with the partner. Uh, a little more about the psychogenic. The psychogenic again is um, further classified into the generalized type and the situational type. And the generalized type, it could just be that this patient is unresponsive to all the sexual stimulus. And oftentimes, this one's happen right from um, once the patient is his sexual debut. Uh, the patient just experiences 
active. He's a, he's a, having good sexual, good um, erectile function. He's completely, whatever arousal, whatever stimulus is sent his way, doesn't get him there. Uh, so that's the generalized unresponsive. It can be due to um, lack of arousal, also be um, age-related. As a patient age, ages, starts gets to the age of 50, 60, I mean, right from 40 though, but more pronounced for 50, 60, the hormone testosterone begins to decline. And because the hormone is declining, um, libido also declines, erectile um, function also um, declines, also declines. However, I mean, this can be taken care of. Um, sometimes patients have some form of inhibition, they had good erections before, but it's had poor sexual, um, sexual experiences. And so he does, he's not looking forward to sex anymore. He, or he's having some problems being intimate with his partner. And that can also be um, because of um, erectile dysfunction in, in this patient. Uh, what's the situational type? In KTs, this patient has erectile dysfunction. He has a weak erection. But he understands that sometimes he has very good erection. And this is related to different things. He realizes that, oh, with this partner, I have very good erection. With this partner, I don't have good erection. So you then know, okay, there's really no problem with the tubes. It's just something in the wiring. The patient is not wired towards that person. Um, so that's partner related. Or when the patient or the person has some form of intimacy uh, problems with his spouse, um, I guess there are men on this, um, on this group. So, um, the lady has asked for something. You are not performing your duty financially. That could also lead to some relational problems and then start to have some uh, erectile dysfunction. Uh, sometimes performance related. Patient has had, person has had some poor uh, performance in the past. Um, this, the partner has not been quite understanding about it. The partner has said some very damning words to the, to the man that affects his ego, and then the person has a vicious circle of anxiety, perform yeah, performance anxiety, and that continues to worsen the um, erectile, erectile problem. Psychological stress. Um, there's a, an adage that, excuse me, please. There's an adage that if your pocket is not deep, your penis should not be stiff. So, I mean, if a man is having some financial problems, he's lost his job, his landlord is asking him to move out, or, I mean, he's in between jobs, or anything of, of that nature, that in itself will lead to some form of erectile, um, can lead to some form of erectile dysfunction. Now, what are the things that puts a man at risk for psychogenic erectile dysfunction? Again, as I mentioned earlier, patient with some form of anxiety, um, either anxiety, from intimacy, anxiety, performance anxiety, patients who are dealing with some form of depression, any patient who's um, any patient who's had a feeling of self inadequacy in sex, uh, he's had cause to discuss his sexual um, history with his colleagues or his friends, um, and I mean he feels he's falling short of what the other colleagues are doing, whether that truthfully or erroneously just um, bloating their own egos by what they say they've done. But he just finds that he feels, oh man, I'm not doing what these guys are doing. How, how do I get better? So that in itself begins to affect the man's psyche, low self-esteem. Sometimes patients just don't know how to describe what they are feeling. And then again, stress. Um, as I earlier mentioned, social ideas on how couples are meant to interact. I put men and women here um, in some environments. It's, Sexes are different, um, so we use the word, we just say partners. Uh, so supposed to interact, and that has got to do to erectile dysfunction. So sometimes patients have unrealistic expectations. You know, some people have photographic expectations of what sexual intercourse should be like. And so they are, are aiming for, they want to be the Superman and fly. And I mean, no matter how much you train, they're not going to fly any anytime soon. Sometimes that happens. And then when you have people who are, your raw models telling you about what sex is and they're giving you the wrong information. So all this can lead to... Dr. Dr. Adimashaw, do you want to 
yeah. give them an example of what the wrong information might be? Yes. Okay. Uh, let 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 put it this way. There are people who will say, "Oh, I, I do have sex and go three to four sessions of sexual intercourse at the at, at the go." Now that's not true. Uh, there's something we call the latent period. After you've ejaculated, is a period where the penis will go a bit flaccid, and it takes a little while before the patient regains his erectile function, uh, the erection. And so somebody comes and says, "Wow, this time I went four times. I went six times at the go in the night, and then early in the morning I went four times again." I mean, if you're trying to achieve such a thing, well, it's a tall order. That's the truth. Um, that's the normal physiology that after ejaculation, the penis is going to go flaccid. Then the patient is going to, you know, the patient is going to take a little while before the arousal comes again and then the patient has another um, erection. Now, the latency period for different patients are different. It's different, actually. So some patients will have 30 minutes to an hour, which is quite good. And some patients will even have it longer than that. I mean, uh, 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 physical power, powers are actually very different. Some people will also say, oh, I go at least three hours before I ejaculate. I mean, studies have shown that most men ejaculate within three to eight minutes of intravaginal uh, penetrative sexual intercourse. So I tell, uh, I mean, the longest ever recorded in history is 45 minutes. Um, and I'm sure that's probably a Guinness Book of Record kind of thing. So asking, um, you know, so asking your patients to look towards having one hour, three hours of continuous intercourse. I mean, even the partner gets tired and pushes the patient off. Usually that happens. In fact, that's even the problem, usually called delayed ejaculation. And that's often the problem. The man will not have any satisfaction. The female also gets tired and thinks sex is quite boring. Okay. Now, the organic erectile dysfunction, like I mentioned earlier, these are where there are actual disease entities that are causing problems, either with the cardiovascular and neurological or hormonal or psychological or brain, you know, things that are obviously there that need to be taken care of. So for cardiovascular, what, uh, this list is not exhaustive, but I've just put it the commonest causes that we find around this environment, cardiovascular diabetes. Um, diabetes is one of the commonest causes of erectile, organic erectile dysfunction in this, um, in this environment. Diabetes can affect the blood vessels. Diabetes can affect the nerves. So it can actually fall both the cardiovascular and neurological. Does it mean every diabetic patient will have erectile dysfunction? No. If the patient has actually taken care of his diabetes properly, and has had good sugar control over a long period of time. You see his um, endocrinologist regularly. Most patients will have good satisfactory um, erectile function. Uh, but as a complication of diabetes, one of the complications is actually erectile dysfunction. And this can actually be very challenging to treat. Hypertension is also a common cause in this environment, affecting the blood vessels, smoking, obesity, now, for obesity, it's been found that patients, even patients with organic ED from obesity, a loss of 10% body weight in itself, just with exercise, diet, and all that, and 10% body weight is lost. The erectile function, you know, it's like you kickstart the engine again. So obesity is one of one of those um, one of those causes. Um, this lipidemia just means the lipids in the blood they are higher than they, they are more than they should be, and this can also be taken care of. Prepism, this is a common cause and is linked often to sickle cell disease, but not related to sickle cell disease alone. And now let me spend a little time on this. Prepism is what is called a persistent, painful, purposeless penile erection. The patient has, or the person has erection that lasts more than four hours. Once erection lasts more than four hours, it's going to become painful. And this erection is not going to go down even when the patient has sexual intercourse and ejaculates. Now, what are the reasons, the common causes of prepresent? The common cause in this environment is actually sickle cell disease. Um, however, another very common cause is people who use erotogenic 
medications, either the non-prescription and prescription, the ones they buy at the bus stop from the ladies carrying things that they call natural herbs, those with either alcohol or non-alcoholic, and they tell you, no, it's for the back. People from my own uh, part of the country will say, oh, uh, they drink all that and say to straighten your back. It's actually for sexual function. Anytime you have um, trado medical colleagues, let me call them that quote, trado medical people come into town and have trade fairs, you have a lot of practice in going around. And that's because many of these drugs contain Viagra, Tadalafil, crushed in those drugs at very high doses. And so when these patients take them, the director may persist beyond four hours. And if this is not intervened between four to eight hours, this patient may actually lose his erection permanently for life. And so it's a quite um, it's a it's quite distressing. Uh, yes, we can still treat post priapism erectile dysfunction, but treatment is not as simple. Sickle cell disease, myocardial infarction, very important. Patients who have had disease, it takes the heart to pump blood into the, excuse me, takes the heart to pump blood into the, um, into the, into the penis. So if the heart is not pumping well, that's a problem. Now, patients who also take drugs to help themselves and have myocardial infarction, they have problems because sex in itself is a very serious physical activity, putting a lot of demand on the heart. But most all urologists will evaluate the patient's heart before beginning to stimulate erection. Patients who have disease that affect the blood vessels. Neuro neurological causes involve nerves to the penis. If there are injuries to the nerves, either from surgery or from radiation or from um, cancers around the pelvis, then patients with Parkinson's disease, spinal cord injured patients, all can be causes of organic um, erectile dysfunction. Hormonal, I, I mentioned earlier that as patients grow older, they have lower levels of testosterone, and um, this in itself can lead to this in itself can lead to erectile. All right, so hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, hyperprolactinemia, these are all hormones that can lead to poor erection. Some drugs, now not all drugs, I've just listed a group of drugs, and even in these groups, not all drugs in these groups, and even the drugs in each group that can cause erectile dysfunction, not all these drugs, not every patient experiences it. So if a patient is on the drug, it's important the patient sees the urologist to try to determine if that is actually the cause of the erectile dysfunction. However, um, to say that some antihypertensive, antipsychotics, antidepressants, some drugs that reduce androgens like testosterone, opiate drugs, and then um, histamine 2, H2 receptor antagonists like cymetidine have been known to reduce uh, erectile function. Um, other drugs, non-prescription drugs, marijuana. Marijuana has been found to also reduce erectile um, libido and erectile function. Uh, mixed organic and psychogenic is actually the commonest cause of erectile dysfunction. Okay. okay, so what can the urologist do to help? Usually we start with a clinical history. The clinical history will involve the sexual history of the patient. We want to know how long this has been, is it partner related, is it performance related, all those things I discussed when I was discussing the psycho. Um, psychogenic causes of erectile dysfunction. Um, what also deep deep into the patient's medical history? Is this patient a diabetic patient? I mean, you know, you, you've seen all the things I've listed. This patient on any medication? Has he had surgery? Has he had you no know, different things that could, could have caused um, this erectile function? Then the psychosocial history very important. What's this patient's background? When did this when did this person get into sexual activity? What has been told this person as a child about sexual intercourse? Oh, sexual intercourse, you know, many times as growing up to avoid premarital um, sex in this environment, our parents will say, oh, don't do bad thing outside. Don't go and, you know, your mouth will say, ishe kushe. And sometimes that in itself has a very bad, um, puts a, a bad thought in the child's head that whenever he's having sexual intercourse, whether as an adult or as a child is a bad thing. And so that somehow is like guilt tripping the, the child. And that sometimes lives on with the child. Um, religious backgrounds also. 
um, will also affect can also affect the patient's erectile um, function. So, what has this child been? You know, what has this child been told in his religion? How religious is this child? And then this um, this sexual activity is about to perform. Does it fall into what is acceptable in his religious um, religious inclination? And sometimes that in itself gives the patient, oh, um, I'm doing something really bad. Um, my my prince is not going to be happy and all that in itself. But when he's done, he has the feeling of guilt, uh, you know, and so sometimes those are things that, so we need to look into all these, the sexual history, medical history, and social history to try to dig and determine is this organic, psychogenic, or actually, again, like I said, commonest, it's a mixed, mixed uh, erectile dysfunction. And you want to examine this patient. And this is where we always have some little challenges. Patients want, oh, doc, I'm having a problem down there. I need something to have a hard on. Yes, I can give you something to have a hard on. Rather, I want to know why you are having problems getting to this point. I need to examine you. Uh, and that I can do over the phone. So I need to see you in person, ask you a few questions, examine you for all these things. I look at the general state of this patient. How healthy is the patient? If the patient's not healthy, definitely everything is going to, I mean, all systems are not go. So you want to look at the general state, general state of this patient's health. You want to look at the external genitalia and the problems there. Sometimes we can find out, oh, this, just by examining the genitalia, the penis, we can say, oh, this patient has had rapism in the past. We can see telltale signs and we know why it's having erectile dysfunction. Or some patients have problems, and are typical problems like what we call hypospadias. And a patient with hypospadias having a problem, or patients with uh, Peyronie's disease, this will cause coverture and painful erection. And so some of these things we will find on examination. Uh, patients may have very small testes uh, that are smaller than usual. So you start beginning to suspect, oh, this baby will go down. This patient may not be producing as much testosterone as it should produce. You want to do a cardiovascular examination, like examine the heart, the blood vessels, determine if it's hypertensive. Some patients don't even know they're hypertensive until they come in. So you, erectile dysfunction may be the first pointer to a much bigger problem. The patient comes in with erectile dysfunction, and the next thing you know, this patient has a heart problem. I send it to a cardiologist. Um, I was um, privileged to see a patient this morning uh, who has just came with erectile dysfunction. After evaluation and everything, I'm thinking this patient has prostate cancer and that's the cause of the problem. So you see, you need to examine the patient. Urological examination is also very important. Then we do basic, basic investigations. These investigations are going to be basic, basic investigations. You want to do simple investigations like the patient's serum testosterone. You want to check the patient's heart with an ECG. You want to do the fasted lipid profile, fasted blood, uh, fasted blood sugar. Those are just the basics we start with. Um, they are the basics we start with. And so, um, yeah, those are the basics we start with. If there's nothing on the investigation, nothing on the, nothing on the investigation, nothing on um, the examination and in the history that suggests an organic cause, then we can start some preliminary treatments at that point in time. However, sometimes you have to be more specific. You found that you think this patient has a cardiovascular problem. You may actually say, oh, sir, you need to go see a cardiologist who will evaluate you further. And once he's good in that direction, we can start treatment. Same thing with new, uh, seeing a neurologist or seeing an endocrinologist for hormonal, uh, hormonal problem. Um, the psychogenic ones, oftentimes we need to do what we call psychosexual, psychosexual um, counseling. Now, what is the treatment? We we'll start with lifestyle changes. I mean, if you found something in a patient that requires a change, I mean, someone who's already going to the gym, I won't start saying, sir, you need more regular exercise. I don't want to kill the patient. He's already having regular exercise, and I won't say that. But for many of us who are, have live a sedentary lifestyle, you want to do a lot, a lot more exercise, walking around, brisk walking, jogging, some little uh, exercise here and there to allow the heart to pump, getting blood to all over the body, including the penis. Exercise will also help with the blood vessels, flow of blood and all that. Exercise also helps with increasing stamina. Sex, again, like I said, is, a, is an uh, physically 
exerting activity, you need to be physically fit to some extent. So exercise helps. A healthy diet, again, I talked about obesity earlier on, a healthy diet, try to reduce um, cholesterol, reduce um, salt, things that could also lead to hypertension and uh, diabetes. Smoking is uh, to stop smoking for patients who are smoking. Um, you want to limit alcohol. Alcohol in itself is not um, known to cause erectile dysfunction. All in all, it said the little alcohol increases libido. A lot of alcohol kills the erection. Now, psychosexual therapy is very important because if the patient's psychosocial history points to certain things, then you need to address those. Um, the patient may need to see a psychosexual therapist. If that's not available, the urologist will have to stand the gap and do the psychosexual counseling, look into the relationship, look into the sexual, um, sexual needs of the patient that was being met by this particular partner. And then so many a times we prefer to do this as couple counseling when the partners are involved. Um, for those who are medication induced, you want to change the medication, stop the medication, recuperate, the and then change medication. Um, organic causes will treat diabetes, um, hypertension, sickle cell disease, I mean, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, you will treat. And then we start with some oral medications. That's usually the baseline. Now, um, okay, so again, psychosexual counseling, you want to educate the couple, assess them. Uh, it's an important part of treatment, improves psychological approach, and has been proven to be actually very effective when you combine this with uh, medication and uh, pharmacotherapy and then psychosexual um, therapy. What are the medications we use? The oral drugs are the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, PDE5. And these drugs actually relax the muscles of the penis and allow, of the vein, vessels in the penis, and allow increased blood flow into the penis. They do not cause an erection without sexual stimulation. And I think that's a very important point as we're taking away from this. A lot of patients take this and just sit and wait for the erection to come on. No, you take this drug and you, look, you get the stimulus for arousal. Then as the arousal comes in, it's a booster. It boosts, makes the erection stiffer and makes the erection um, last longer. A few of the um, known drugs, Sidenafil, which is Viagra, Sidenafil, Vadenafil, and Avanafil. These are very common drugs. Uh, many patients have used and all abused to them. Um, then there's the intercarbinosal injection if the oral medications are not working. This patient is taught to inject these drugs directly into the penis. And these ones do not need stimulus to cause arousal. Once you inject them, the penis becomes erect on its own. Aprostadil, papaverin, pentolamine. This mix is just a mixture of two of them. Why try mix is uh, one that contains the three drugs together. This is also an option, and this is very um, effective, though quite expensive. Some of these drugs can be inserted into the urethra, which is the hole where urine comes out. And they dissolve and they also absorb and they cause, um, cause erection. There are vacuum assisted devices or vacuum erection devices, who, which um, via vacuum, either manually or electronically, suck blood into the penis. And then a ring is placed at the root of the penis to stop blood from flowing out. And um, that also causes erection. Shockwave therapy. For those who have problems with their vessels and need revascularization, we have vascular surgery. Not too common, but still um, occurs. And then finally, penile implants. The shockwave therapy just uses short pulses of shockwaves um, at low, uh, low intensity directed towards the penis to improve blood flow. It causes um, um, new vascularization. That's um, new blood vessels are formed and blood flows into the penis. Not very popular, not very available. Some say it's still research. Very safe. They need several sessions before there's um, effect, and sometimes one may need to repeat it. I mentioned the vacuum erector device, the cylindrical, de uh, cylindrical shaped device, and it comes um, just put on the penis. I'll show you a picture of it. Put it on the penis. In this case, this is a manual. You can see the patient is trying to um, create the vacuum by pumping this penis. Then the ring will be placed at the base of the penis to maintain the erection. Please, the ring must not be there for more than 30 minutes. 
why is that could lead to serious problems. And lastly, if all that does not work, we have what we call penal prosthesis. There are implants. Um, this is the most sophisticated type. This is called the three-piece inflatable. It's um, there's a surgery to insert this into the penis. And once the patient has a reservoir here of fluid, once the patient wants to have an erection, he pumps this, which is in the scrotum. This is the pump, pumps this, and then it is becomes erect. So it's an on-the-go thing. Uh, there's also the two-piece and the semi-rigid. The semi-rigid is almost always rigid. The patient bends the penis, straightens the penis to have intercourse and bends it back when he's done. However, this is like the, the most advanced um, of them all. Um, this is a very um, not simple surgery, not very available, and the processes themselves or the implants themselves are pretty expensive, pretty expensive. So those are penile processes. These are options that um, can be offered to patients who have had maybe erectile dysfunction that is not responding to any of these medications or uh, other therapies, and then you can give this patient a penile processes. Or patients who have had um, practice, like I mentioned earlier, and have lost erection totally, none of the other um, therapies will work. So penile processes, all that is available to Search. So I'll conclude by saying erectile dysfunction can have negative effect on your sex life. It's difficult to feel attractive and confident or be intimate with your partner when you feel you're able to give him or her. Again, give him or her because of other environments. You need to give him or her the pleasure he deserves. It's caused by a myriad, causes a myriad and uh, let's all remember erectile dysfunction can be treated. Thank you very much for listening. I uh, guess I'll have time to take some comments and questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Marshall. Thank you so much. I mean, it's, he said a lot about some of the um, common problems or questions that we have. I can see while Dr. Marshall was talking that a lot of people were dropping comments. So. We'll look at your questions. We'll take your questions soon. We'll take one or two of those questions before we actually move on to um, talking to Dr. To Sabi Doctor. So Sabi Doctor can also break down some of the big, big grammar that Dr. Anima Shao blew for us. Because, you know, <laughs> yes, uh, sometimes we doctors can speak up there and it may not be so easy for everybody to really understand what we're saying. So Sabi Doctor is here, and we'll also together break down some of those um, things he said, and then answer some of the questions that have been asked. So uh, Sabi Doctor, welcome. Are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, thank you. So, uh, I just to so I'll just introduce Sabi Doctor briefly. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Damian Ava. He's an award-winning health educator, uh, practicing and certified medical doctor, health influencer. And he's renowned for his health education posts on social media where he commands a large national and international following. He's also a member of the International, International Society of Sexual Medicine, and he's a co-founder of Sabimom underscore NG, an online platform that leverages digital technology to provide oh, pregnant oh, oh. women and nursing mothers in Nigeria with access to useful information. So, I mean, I had a session with Dr. Uh, to Sabi Doctor. I should be calling you Dr. Sabi too, anyway. <laughs> I had a session with him recently, and um, that was on Thursday, and he really broke down some of those things. I can't forget some of the things he said. And he was also, for those that were on the IG live and are here now, there was this sound he kept saying, pa, 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 pa. I don't know, maybe he will explain more what that pa, 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 pa means. Um, it sounds like clapping, but it also sounds like it's more. Um, so we'll just move to some of the questions that have been asked. Uh, first, I mean, Dr. Anima Shaw has broken down things for us and he's shown us um, some of the common causes of um, erectile dysfunction. Yeah, and I think, um, like he's also highlighted and like research has shown, a lot of it can also be um, um, can be psychogenic um, as well as Hello, some other organic causes. We're well. having a yeah, webinar. Um, so I think basically, without one question was 
Uh, someone asked them, that's the tennis. So, so yeah. there's a question around them. Um, yes. Noticing that the first, someone asked a question around how to reduce quick ejaculation. It says sometimes I ejaculate even before the sex starts. So, so that sounds more like a premature ejaculation uh, than an erectile dysfunction. Uh, so I think I'll throw, I'll pull in Dr. Animasha and Sabi Doctor. So Sabi Doctor, what do you have to say to this person? How, does it, how will you reduce quick ejaculation? It's noticed that sometimes he ejaculates even before the sex actually starts, before sex actually starts. Uh, Sabi Doctor, come on, show us that you um, said. Okay, so thank you, Doctor. It would be um, very um, brilliant introduction. And let me also thank um, Dr. Nima Shaun. He has done justice to the, uh, to the topic. In fact, I listened to him from the beginning until the end. He was very exhausted. Um, there's nothing more to add. Now, with, with respect to the question, premature ejaculation, I um, mean, treatment essentially will um, depend on the cause or the causal factor in this case. Okay. Uh, typically, what we usually notice um, when, when we interact with patients who are complaining of erectile, I mean, premature ejaculation now, is that theirs is mostly anxiety related, performance anxiety. Of course, there are causes that are, you know, organic. For example, this if a man has hypersensitivity of his penis, that can play a role in, you know, I mean, um, in premature ejaculation as well. But essentially, most cases are due to performance anxiety, where the man over analyzes, over prepares for sex, such that when he eventually, you know, um, gets into the phase where sex has to happen, he is overly excitable, anxiety is off the roof, and then, you know, he just, um, and, you know, um, expel the seed prematurely. Okay. Having said that, I should emphasize something before I get to, um, you know, treatment modality. And this is based on the fact that what some people would term premature ejaculation may be different for front, but one another people will describe as premature ejaculation. If you remember during our live session, I made mention of the fact that some people. 10 minutes, they are fine with it. They have already organized Both partners are satisfied. Why are other people? That 10 minutes is just, they are just getting warmed up. How can you come in 10 minutes? It's not possible. So it is still couple related or patient dependent when you want to like really um, define premature ejaculation. So there are some numbers we tend to give to it. still depends on, on the couple. Having said that, if I mean, if you are really looking at premature ejaculation from the context of um, from the context of performance anxiety, or maybe uh, yeah, performance anxiety. Now, of course, uh, you have to really train that person, essentially, for called CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, where you actually train the person to relax. Okay, and of course, there are other things as well. So. Oftentimes, why would tell the person not to prepare? Well, to give them tips on how to prosecute the sexual interface. For example, um, um, well, especially in young people, they just, you know, see a pants and start doing clap, 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 clap. Of course, if you start like that, you are, if you start, in fact, there is a thing um, in the streets. If you start quick, you come quick. Okay, if that's if you have a challenge with premature ejaculation, so you want to start slow, you want to reduce the reading or the uh, frequency of thrust. You start gradually, uh, get into the sex before you now, you know, vary the pace and increase it as, as desired. Okay, so um, reading control or pace control is very, very important. Then again, even before you penetrate, you can do some very generous amount of foreplay. That is very important because. During the four plate um, phase, you get to like calm down, it calms you down. But if you just tear the pants and begin to do pa, 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 you don't really have to act and then um, do the job. So spend some time into the four, um, uh, 
spend some time, you know, with foreplay, then when you eventually get, of course, with, with the foreplay, your partner also gets relaxed, gets wet, and um, you can enjoy the sex better. So those are some tips. Um, that said, there are also medical therapies available, okay? Um, but even before medical therapies, some do um, squeeze, um, squeeze and relax technique where, you know, they, they squeeze the, the tip of the penis when you start feeling the urge. Because if you are looking at the sexual response cycle, yeah, there is the orgasm phase. So um, before you get to orgasm, there is something they call the point of no return. Where essentially, by this, when you get to that point, you will not be able to stop orgasm anymore. So if you are very knowledgeable, you understand your sexual response cycle, you know, you can begin to tell when the urge to orgasm is starting to build up. Sometimes all you, all, all you really need to do is to just decelerate your uh, frequency of thrust. You reduce the speed of thrust. Or sometimes you can even pull out. Or sometimes just stay motionless. Don't keep trusting. Okay. Incidentally, that is usually some time where, or that's usually the time where some partners will, uh, will, will back on you to go harder, 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 harder. And if you are not very careful, as you are going harder, 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 you also come faster, faster, faster. So, you know, if you understand your sexual response cycle pretty well, you know when the urge for orgasm is starting to build up, you can quickly, um, you know, reduce your pace of thrust or pull out. And then if you get busy with something, you can probably absorb the girl's breast or the woman's breast or just do something else until you gather yourself before you penetrate. That's that about that. Then, of course, there are drugs as well. Okay? In this case, let's say the person has hypersensitivity. Yeah, sorry, doctor. Wait, 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 wait. Don't finish everything. So that okay. let's also okay. be careful. <laughs> all right. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. This question. Let, let, let the doctor Anima shall speak over. So, doctor, do you have anything to, less to add to what uh, Sabi doctor has said? Uh, well, Thank you, Sabi Doctor. Obvious that you Sabi. Um, it's also good uh, meeting or at least interacting with you too. I'm happy to, to do that. Um, he said a lot and um, very little to add. He started by saying it's dependent on the course, which is, I mean, everything boils around that. It depends on the course. Now, he's also mentioned a lot of um, uh, cognitive uh, behavioral therapy that can be done, and he's been quite explicit about them. The only thing I want to add concerning that is sometimes use of condoms has been found to make the patient last longer, it's sensitivity. Um, sometimes um, acne uh, dominated positions when the female is in charge are uh, also um, things that can be done, you know, instead of the man the one doing the thrusting, the female is the one doing the thrusting. She's on top, whatever position, and, you know, and so those are things that can be done. And every other thing he's actually said. Then, again, drugs. However, before we get to drugs, we also want to rule out any organic cause for premature ejaculation. So you want to, um, you want to rule out any cause. If there are no causes that tried all these other behavioral therapies, then you may want to use a uh, medication. Okay, thank you. Thank you for adding that. Um, so you, you heard what he said about um, positioning as well. So it also matters. So someone said, um, I noticed that my first round doesn't last. Um, how, how can I um, prolong my first round and be quickly ready for other rounds? Uh, Sabi, do you want to take that? Uh, all right. I got your question on Dr. Oya. The question was to know um, how to you know, extend the duration for the first round. Now, the thing here is what people should really understand is generally speaking, the first round is not so, doesn't really last that long. Most men, right? Most men usually do under 10 minutes for the first round. In fact, it's an average of, uh, it's an average of seven minutes. Most men, okay? And that is because the first round you are still excited, you are jubilant, anxiety is also there, you know, and that can actually affect the situation of sex. So oftentimes, if you are able to do the second, you can still do the second or third round. Good for you because what you.
you will notice this by the second round, you are able to start strong. In fact, by the time you get to the third round, fourth round, those of you who have a very high um, libido, you can do fourth round in the space of 24 hours. If you can get to the third round, you would have noticed that the steps become you know, very long. Even the volume of semen ejaculated, ejaculated by the time you are um, reaching orgasm. It's so, so minute, very little amount. In fact, sometimes you can see droplets, just droplets at the tip of the finger. Um, so, yes, if you can go to the second round, the third round, I will just be not really bother so much about the first round. Just use that first round to start, okay? Because it seems like you really don't have so much any uh, problem when you get to the second round, okay? So, if you can go to the second round and just use the first round to start, then when you get to the second round, you can really flex the most you can come into woman and it Okay, so that's that about the um, that. Having said that, I mean, if of course you are the type that maybe you cannot extend beyond because some people have a very very round after some people are like that, you know. So depending on your refractive period, if that if It seems um, Savi Doctor is having some technical issues. Uh, so I think um, he said some things already about the first round and all that. So we'll just move from that question uh, to, the, to the next question. Uh, can you hear me, Doctor? Yes, 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 you're back, you're back. Hello. So we'll move to the next question around um, waking up. Hello. Hello, sorry, Doctor. We can I can hear you, but it seems your connection is a bit weak um, from that end. So I think we'll just move on to the next question. I noticed that we wow. can hear you. We can hear you. So I noticed that I've been waking, I've not been waking up with an erection for a very long time, more than a year plus. I do wake up stiff maybe once in two months. I think this is one of the reasons that has made me. A one minute man, or maybe not. Do I need help, uh, Doctor Anima? Do you want to take that? So basically, the person hasn't been having um, early morning erections for a long yeah. time. Yeah. Right okay. Yeah. The, the 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 question. I think the first question to answer: Do I need help? Yes, you do. Um, you truly do need help because, I mean, it's obviously a a point of concern to you. For you to post it on the blog, and it means it's something that we should. It means you are not satisfied with what you're getting. So definitely, you would uh, require some help. Now, what is causing it? I cannot say again, truly, because in, until one interacts with you, before one is able to say, "Oh, okay, how old are you? What has gone on? What are the things happening with you?" and all that, before one can actually determine what the cause is and how help can be rendered. But yes, I agree with you. You said this has been happening for just one year. It means earlier than this, you were having early morning erections. Earlier than this, you were having um, good erectile function for sexual intercourse. You, you at least assume you are, you, you assume that you are having good sexual intercourse prior to this. So definitely you need help. You should see a professional about it. Um, and then uh, I'm sure, uh, I hope you would get the help you need. Thank um, you. Just to link yeah, to what um, Dr. Anima Ashan just said, for, for many people um, here, the, a link has been dropped in the chat section where you can book an appointment with a uh, specialist like Dr. Anima Ashan for a consultation um, for whatever issues you may be having around performance. Um, also, you can also book tests. We have some tests um, that are targeted specifically at men. Uh, once you click on that link, you will see the breakdown of the tests and also you have a portion for booking an appointment with Dr. Andy Marshall as well. So basically, um, we have a healthy man check and we have a check for uh, erectile dysfunction screening as well. And once you book, uh, click that link, you can easily book your appointment, fill whatever forms or you, so if you um, take whatever test you want to do and then you can get that sorted 
But definitely, uh, like Dr. Animashaw has said, that person, you would benefit a lot from a consultation with a specialist to start looking at whatever the problem may be, um, especially since it's still in the early stages. So whatever needs to be done can be done fast um, before maybe whatever is going on becomes more permanent. So I think we can also move to the next question. I don't know what this is. Maybe Sabi Doctor will know because I, it looks like he knows a lot of these things. Um, does, I don't know if it's Odeku or Odeku, I don't know how to pronounce it. Does Odeku and milk help with latency time? Uh, yes. So I, I don't know, maybe Sabi Doctor, Dr. Ali is not familiar Let Sabi Doctor take it. Let's see what he okay. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not aware that the a mixture of the uh, old and milk, uh, you know, in crazy uh, for, for the uninitiated. Uh, so yeah, for, for those of you who may not really know, old is like I think South, 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 you know, uh, Guinness South. That's what they call it. So, so what the person is saying here is okay, to make old queen milk. Uh, anyone should always that milk, you know, for long uh, sexuation. I am not aware of that. Now, given that Udeko, that sound has some percentage of alcohol in it, one can actually reason that because um, oftentimes premature ejaculation revolves around performance and size. And size. If there is some liquor in the system, it can help um, you know, lessen the anxiety that the fatigue or the fear. And you know, that, that can uh, elongate the duration of sex. So, at least theoretically speaking, okay, because um, even in, the, in my experience dealing with some, some of these things, you see some that say when okay, they take alcohol, a little bit of alcohol is that stronger. Okay, I think um, it, it has to do with the fact that alcohol sort of reduces the perception of um, whatever is happening around. So they are not overly analyzing the sexual performance. Same thing with what happens when you take a bit of alcohol, you feel a little bit excited, you feel a bit courageous, you can walk up to a group and say, and stuff like that. So that's what I can say about that. I don't know if Dr. Animachan has uh, something else to add. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I agree with you. Um, my research or any, yes, um, I don't know if I'm on a, uninitiated either, but I know that is uh, the stout and then milk and then the mixture of, <laughs> the mixture of it. I don't know what the, I don't know what the mixture becomes. So it's difficult to say um, categorically that it works, it doesn't work. However, there's been no study to, to prove that. Um, what he has said about the alcohol, yeah, like I said, increases um, sexual arousal, erect, uh, and some erection. However, when it's too much, the patient loses everything. However, um, again, maybe I didn't mention this. I'd like to say at this point that the most important sexual organ is the brain. The brain is the most important sexual organ. Once the brain doesn't get into gear, nothing else moves. So it's the reason why a grown man sees a naked um, boat and doesn't have an erection because the brain doesn't move it together, doesn't see anything. I mean, there's nothing there happening. However, you see a beautiful lady and then you say, wow, something is happening here. You know, in fact, like the, the penis begins to have a mind of its own. So if you have that mindset also that alcohol works for you and you have tried it and it works for you, as long as that is socially acceptable to you, hey, go ahead. Just in moderation, whatever works. So sex is not particularly um, one size fits all. What would help one person or what arouses one person may actually just, you know, we look and say, oh, I said, man, that babe, fine. And somebody else will say, what do you they see? So it's a break. So if it yeah. works, I mean, fine, if it works. But yeah. I cannot, I don't prescribe that, and I don't have any studies to back it up. So, so that's what yeah, I can say. I think um, they've highlighted something about reducing the inhibitions and um, 
all of that. But of course, you want to be careful. Be careful. You don't want to be a man that every time you want to have sex with your partner, you have to rely on alcohol to, to do that. Um, because long term, you're also damaging some other organs. And even long term, you may cause damage to the blood vessels. So, so you, you really want to be able to utilize the newest sex organ most of us have just learned, the brain. So most of us know the sex organs to be maybe the penis, um, the vagina, the vulva, the, uh, all of that, breasts. So those are the things we think of when we think of sex organs. We don't think of the brain as a sex organ, but like he said, and like we'll find out repeatedly in the course of our conversations today, the brain is the most powerful sex organ, really. Everything starts from here and then it goes down there. Uh, so while there are two brains for men, like they usually say, one brain is still more superior to the other. So let's um, ask us some modern questions. Someone asked what should be the normal refractory time after release of semen during sex. Um, I think Sabi Doctor already said it um, before and I was just chipping a little and then maybe he will add as well. Uh, basically it's about uh, everybody's refractory time may differ a bit, but I think as you get older, your refractory time tends to get longer. Um, generally speaking. So Shabi Doctor was talking about someone that imagine you are you're struggling with premature ejaculation and you have a refractory time of uh, one week. <laughs> so that's double jeopardy because I mean on one hand if you release now it means the one week your partner is just on her on her own. So it may be very difficult. So Shabi Doctor, you want to add more to what I've said? Okay. Um thank you Doctor Oya. Yeah. Um so, I mean, like I mentioned during the live session, you know, it, it, it depends on the person. Age also comes into play. It also comes into play. Because if you look at the refractive period in teenagers, boy, I mean, teenage boys, and also young men in their early 20s, they are about in older men. Okay, and of course, I, I, mean, I made mention of the fact that as men get older, testosterone also is dropping. All of this can have um, an affect um, sexual performance and even the refractory period. But mo most times in young people, I'm um, particularly um, emphasizing the duration in young people, it, it can anywhere between 15 to 30 minutes, two hours, it, it's fine. Again, it still depends on the person. Some people, it, it can be so dramatic that once they uh, maybe ejaculate, they ejaculate, right? Like five, 10 minutes after they are, they are back on, on set and they're ready to go, okay? It can be that um, dramatic in some people. But again, for the majority of people, anywhere between 15 to 30 minutes to a year, they you know, recover quite quickly. Then there are also those that, you know, uh, it takes a bit longer, four hours from, the older you get, the longer it takes, okay, for you to recover after a bit of sex. But there is something that people talk about that I'll just bring in before we move quickly to the next question. People talk about multiple orgasms in men. And um, Okay, so, so I mean, so, that so, idea so, of multiple so, orgasms, so, right? So let's see what he wants to tell us. I can see okay. <laughs> to this part, so... Uh, you're, you're muted. Okay, good. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, well, multiple orgasms. Uh, there are a lot of things on the web. Um, anything that has to do with sexual pleasure um, is often exploited. That's the truth because it's something that uh, it controls. I mean, it's a basic need in most people. And having a good sexual um experience is, you know, uh, even if you had one and somebody tells you you can have it even better, you're having a fantastic one. But the fact that they say you can have it better is like money. I have a billion, if I can get two, I mean, the more the merrier. So people exploit that. Um, there are no scientific evidences of multiple orgasms. Men have climax, have orgasms and ejaculates. How then you have orgasm and not ejaculate? It's a bit um, neither here nor there. I, I can't say it doesn't happen. I mean, the knowledge is evolving. 
people are trying new techniques that are um, unorthodox and maybe working. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm open to it. If somebody tells me, oh, this is how to have multiple organisms and what the person is suggesting is not, uh, is, I, I find that it's not harmful. I mean, I'm open to even personally try it. However, what I'm more conscious of is a patient, a person can actually have repeated orgasms on different sexual, I mean, let's say first round, second round, third round, and each round ends with an, uh, with an orgasm. However, having multiple orgasms in one round, I'm not, uh, not too aware of that. Uh, I like how uh, I know I shall answer this question. He basically said, I'm for everybody, I'm for nobody. He just, you <laughs> don't go out try to say, The ah, one will, will be very expensive. Yeah, I mean, this a I mean, complex or? My colleague, I don't know if you have something to add to that, Dr. Sabi, Doctor. Sabi, Doctor. Do you want to say? I'm, I'm open, truly. Yeah. So, I mean, um, you have said that um, the way it should be said. Um, just to add, I think the whole idea around multiple orgasms, if you actually want to look at it um, classical, logically now, it's really not multiple organs. So what most of them do, because it, it's, it's an idea that is beginning to um, become mainstream, what they essentially do is that they do what they call semen retention. So the orgasm, but they find a way to prevent an ejaculation. Okay, so there is an orgasm without an ejaculation. They call it semen retention. And there are some techniques around um, how you can withhold semen. But again, I mean, the fact that you are able to withhold semen does not automatically eliminate um, the um, refractive period. One can still have it. Okay, the whole idea of multiple orgasms actually applies more to women, not, not men. Okay, not, it's, it's, it's something that you can actually argue for women, not really men. You, you have orgasms, you have orgasms. Whether you ejaculate or not, that's a different thing entirely. Okay. Yes, I, I totally agree with what you just said. For women, yes, in the man's one round, the woman can orgasm multiple times. And actually, that is one of the goals of sexual intercourse by the mind. It gives you, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel you are, I mean, you're on top of your game when your partner can orgasm multiple times in each round. Now, women tend to orgasm, men orgasm almost with intravaginal penetrative sexual intercourse. Women can orgasm from foreplay to um, um, oral, oral sex to manual stimulations to different things and even in the same um, intravaginal penetrative sexual intercourse the woman can still more be, be, be more experienced and more uh, pleasing it is to her she can orgasm multiple times over the man yes okay. um, I think I'll also try to get more knowledge on this semen retention thing Okay, so uh, it's good as we're all learning. Um, so let's take some of the questions left pretty fast. So we have one talking about having painful erections. Um, it hasn't happened in a while, but it seems to have a bigger issue. He notices that he can no longer feel his penis, like he doesn't have a pulse, no erectile muscles or what have you. Seems smaller and more withdrawn, and he doesn't get erections except when he's with his partner. And he has actually had sex, sex since then. But he knows this occasionally I feel a heating sensation um, recently. I, 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 I feel like this is a bit, I'm not sure what's going on here, but definitely this person would benefit from a consultation. Um, and definitely. Uh, so I think definitely to advise you, we can drop the link again to the, to the questions, to the consultation and the test as well. So, Whoever this question is, please do well to fill that form so you can actually um, get, because I, you will benefit more from a one-on-one -on -one session than maybe a general response to this question. So we can also answer the more general questions. So someone is asking, there's a relationship between erectile dysfunction and low sperm count. Um, 
who would take that? Let's just be brief a bit in our answers. Okay, Dr. Ani Marshall. Um, okay. Is there a relationship between erectile dysfunction and no sperm count? They may be, they may not be. Now, why do I say they may be? I mean, if the cause of erectile dysfunction is something like hormonal, low testosterone, the production of sperm is also dependent on testosterone. And that in itself will also affect sperm production. So yes, they might be, and they might not be. Um, they just also be psychogenic and the cause of the erectile dysfunction it's completely different. Also, if there are things like um, there's an entity called varicocil. Varicocil can affect sperm production. It affects generally the the function of the testes, which is one to produce testosterone, steroidogenic, and two to produce um, sperm, spermatozoa, as a spermatogenic function. So when it affects both of them, sperm will be going down, and then testosterone also goes down. And as testosterone goes down, libido will reduce. Quality of erection could also reduce. Yes, it may be related and it may also be completely unrelated. You understand? So that's, yes. that's the answer. Yes. So um, based on what Dr. Animachow has said, again, if someone is experiencing something like that, definitely need to be explored a bit further to find out what the underlying cause may be. So you can actually get the appropriate um, treatment so as applicable. So um, I think once again, the form is there. You can book an appointment with them. Um, Dr. Ali Mashaun to have those conversations. And you can also do one or two tests as well on that form. So I think we'll move to the next question. Um, the person is asking, can the use of penis pump improve erection? So Sabi Doctor, let's take that quickly. Uh, can the use of penis pump improve erection? Um, I mean, uh, okay. Okay, yes, you can hear me. I mean, Dr. Ali Mashaun has already exhausted that during the lecture. And uh, you know, um, it's one of the treatment modalities here where you use a penis pump to, you know, inflate the penis to be able to um, have very penetrative sex. So yes, can okay, absolutely can. If you like follow the lecture, we have Dr. Animasha. In fact, there was a very vivid image of a penis pump, a demonstration of how the penis pump uh, works. Okay, so yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, Sorry, yes, Dr. So, Oya. Okay, you want to add something quickly? Yes, just to add, um, I always advised uh, that you try to um, have professional help before you choose whatever um, modality you're using. In this form, yes, it could work, but then it depends on what was causing in the first place. So it's not wise to um, invest your hard-earned money into a penis pump, then after that, it doesn't work. And then you say, wow, he said it worked and it doesn't work. So um, it depends on what is happening, situation, and then it will work. So you may be advised on different, your circumstances may be different and maybe advised on different things. It's like when women want um, family planning, you're advising on different, um, many of them work. So you have to advise on these are individual women, women, what you think will be the best. So that's just to chip it. But yes, like, um, doctor uh, Sabi, doctor said it truly works, it truly works, and it's really available and affordable too. Okay, thank you. So one of the questions here we've answered it before about um, not having erections in the morning, and also thinking that it's affecting your ability to perform. So we've answered this question earlier. Um, so what you can do is definitely uh, fill that form that is in the um, chat section because you definitely want to have this conversation in a more one-on-one -on -one setting to explore what may be going wrong and uh, whatever issues you may need to be addressed. So someone is asking again, what's the normal testosterone range? Uh, is 3.0 nanograms per day or good? If not, what ways can testosterone be boosted? So I think the key question here is what ways can testosterone be boosted? I think that's what the person really wants to know um, above every other thing. So Dr. Ani Marshall, are there meals you can take or routines you can undergo to boost your testosterone level? Um, or is it something that whatever you have is what you have, you can't do anything? Now, um, I'll start with the range itself. Um, three points, depending on the lab you're using, 
Some labs will start from 2.8, some labs will start from 2. But most labs will agree that 3.0 is within the normal range. However, on the low side of normal range, it ranges to about 10, you know, 9 to 10. So depending on the lab. So three is on the lower range. However, why would you be bothered about testosterone range? We only bother about testosterone if it is a direct um, link to a problem, either fertility or erection or libido. Now, for a person who has a testosterone of 3.0 and he's firing on all cylinders, I mean, V8, Tundra, and going fine, all his sexual partners are in fact, looking forward to seeing him. And uh, maybe he wants to have kids, he has them as... So, I mean, why would you bother with your testosterone? Can testosterone be boosted? Yes, it can be boosted. Unfortunately, there are no... Um, scientifically speaking now, there are no foods that boost testosterone. All we do is so we all heal the, eat a healthy diet and also um, live a healthy lifestyle. Um, when we boost testosterone, we use oral medications or what we call hormone replacement therapy. And that is as a form of treatment, meaning that there's a problem. So there must be a problem for us to say, oh, let's boost the testosterone, you understand? So basically that's the way I'll answer this question. I can't prescribe any food or drink or, or herbs that you can take that will boost your testosterone. Basically a healthy diet, good exercise, regular sleep, um, Anything that will not affect your testicular function, no tight fitting underwear, um, limit your soda bath for those who do that. I uh, mean, we do that in this environment, but do limit your so, uh, soda baths and anything that will cause heat towards that area. Those who drive, yeah, long distance drivers is also a problem. So you may have to wear very loose underwear and loose um, trousers so that you can have air down there to make the cabin as uh, aerated as possible. I mean, basically yeah, I think, uh, Basically, like uh, Dr. Nimasha has said, maintaining your health um, is very important. Like the healthier you are, the, the more your chances of ensuring that your uh, testosterone levels are fine is also good, will also be so, Based on this, just jumping in on that to so just talk about one of the things we also offer here at Doctor Connect, our facilities in Alausa. So we have um, an annual health check. It's a comprehensive check that is basically a head to toe check from uh, your your eyes, your hearing, does a full body analysis of your joints and and your posture. So basically, you can't do a point joint and posture check anywhere in Nigeria at the moment, but we have the um, facility to do it here in Alausa. We do an ECG. We check your cardiovascular function, your liver and your lipid profile. Because earlier, Dr. Animasha was talking about some of the things that can um, cause um, um, erectile dysfunction. And he talked about organic causes. Some of the chronic diseases like diabetes and um, hypertension can definitely cause um, or lead to some of those problems. So if you have an annual health check at least once a year, it's a good way to know what's happening in your body, what you need to do, and then also how to solve some of these problems because you may be suffering with weak you may be suffering from weak erections or whatever and the, the the underlying cause is just something that you can easily detect from a regular screening so it's also something you want to check out if it's something you're interested in uh, you can also find we'll drop some links for you to be able to um, book an appointment or you can download our app and book a wellness check right there so I'll just take the remaining questions. We are basically almost done with the questions. I just wanted to share that um, before uh, moving to the next question. So basically, someone is talking about a um, 62-year-old man successfully treated prostate enlargement, but um, experiencing weak erection, erectile dysfunction, and shrinking of penis. Uh, um, Dr. Nimash, I'll just take that quickly. Let's... I, I, yeah. For the person who's treated prostate enlargement um, and is having erectile dysfunction, uh, first I'll say that an enlarged prostate has been found to be associated with erectile dysfunction. Um, the direct, the cause, the direct cause is not really known. The prostate is enlarged, that's not to do with the erection, but somehow it's been found that 
patients who have a, a large prostate, and are having urinary symptoms of their large prostate, tend to have erectile. Um, they also have associated erectile dysfunction. And as you treat the urinary symptoms and you get better, the erection also gets better. However, when you say you successfully treated prostate enlargement, I'm not sure what treatment you, this patient has had. Has he had surgical intervention? Um, because the surgery itself can also be a risk for erectile dysfunction. It can be a risk for retrograde ejaculation. Some of the drugs used in managing enlarged prostates can also lead to retrograde ejaculation and um, especially reduced um, libido. So I'm not sure what treatment the patient has had, but um, whoever successfully treated this patient, I presume must be a urologist, should also look into this erectile um, condition and help this patient out. This patient will benefit from review and Thank you very much. Uh, so let's take the last two questions. I will ask Sabi Doctor to just round off um, some of those things. Uh, and then Dr. Animasha will round off them, we'll be done for the day. So the last two questions, I'll direct them more to Dr. Animasha, uh, since you are the specialist in the house. So basically someone is asking, can l pills improve erection? And the second question is, I should talk more about Prilgi. Um, Prilgi was prescribed for treatment of premature ejaculation. So the person wants to learn more about the drug. So uh, we can just take those two questions together in the next 30 seconds so we can round off. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Okay, um, l arginine is, I mean, an amino acid. Does it improve erection? Uh, there's no document to support that. Is it harmful? I don't think so. Um, so sometimes, like I said again, it's the brain. Because he's popping the pills and he thinks he's getting a better erection, I'm not going to ask him to stop because I know it's not harmful. But can this be used for treating erectile dysfunction? No, not, not really. Um, just an amino acid. So it's a supplement in case the patient is not getting enough uh, enough amino acids. Um, Pre-DG was prescribed to treat premature ejaculation by a urologist. Uh, I'm not sure what education this patient would like me to to, to give. Um, it was obviously prescribed by a urologist. I would expect that the person who prescribed it is um, saddled with the burden of talking about the use and the side effects of the drug. However, um, Prelegy is um, a short, is actually Dapoxid. Uh, Prelegy is the trade name. Uh, I, I'm trying not to say too much because I, I don't work for the company. I'm not advertising the drug. Do I know that? Do I think it works? Yes, I believe it, it does work. Um, it's actually Dapoxid. It's a short acting um, uh, serotonin uh, selective um, receptor inhibitor, an SSRI. And um, it was initially produced in the treatment of. Um, uh, depression. However, it did work for depression, but the, the supposed side effect then was to realize that it's, it's prolonged uh, uh, erection and improved um, premature ejaculation. It is now licensed as um, probably the only licensed medication for treatment of premature ejaculation, and it does work. Usually, the patient takes it about hours before um, sexual intercourse, and then the um, patient may require repeated um, dosing before the satisfactory effect is possible. But yes, it does work. Thank you. That, uh, yes, I, at least, satisfactory. like you said, um, the person needs more in-depth review, or maybe it, it may be best to have a more one-on-one -on -one session with you um, to have that kind of review take place, because you don't want to also say too much in a public setting like this um, about medications and all. So I think we'll just round the hand over to Sabi Doctor. So Sabi Doctor, just tell us quick three things that, uh, well, you may have more than three anyway, but three things that you think um, you would advise men to do um, to stay at the top of their game in terms of their sexual health as regards um, STIs, premature ejaculation, and uh, erectile dysfunction that we've discussed on Thursday and today as well. So what are the three, thing, um, three things? Uh, okay, thank you, Dr. Um, I mean, 
Uh, Dr. Anima Shaw has said practically everything that needs to be said, okay? and the session has been pretty exhaustive. Um, having said that, I want to like use the opportunity to single out something he mentioned during the course of his lecture that is very important, uh, but also missed most times. The fact that oftentimes when people present or when men present with erectile dysfunction, there is you know, typically a cardiovascular link to that erectile dysfunction. Hi, Dr. Marshall. Uh, Okay. Okay, Sabi, Doctor. Uh, yes, I was having. Um, I don't know if it's on my end or your end. The network is, you know. Anyway, like I was saying, there is a link between, you know, in, in most cases of erectile dysfunction, between um, erectile dysfunction and cardiovascular disease. And when when patients bypass doctors or they bypass um, health checks and go directly to the pharmacy store to get medication medications, these uh, cardiovascular conditions go on for note until a, a point is reached where yeah, oftentimes it results in fatality. So it's very important as a man, if you are having an erectile dysfunction, that is, um, that you cannot really tell for sure whether it is hycogenic or um, uh, organic, it's important that you see a doctor. In this case, we have even Dr. Anima Shah in the house, he's a consultant urologist, and then there are also other doctors on the platform, a doctor who can, you know, um, interface with patients and help them um, understand what tests to do and what not, so that they can get to the bottom of the problem. So my message essentially is, gentlemen, if you're listening, please, uh, if you have any challenge with your health, sexual health, particularly erectile dysfunction, it's important that you see a doctor. Of course, these drugs can be sourced over the counter. It doesn't mean you should bypass the importance or the, the, the need to see a doctor. Very important. Then again, just to add to um, STI, because um, you know you might be, you might really think that with the awareness around condom, people are practicing safe sex. That is not really the case. Okay, quite a number of people, a large number of young people particularly young people are having um, sex that is not um, categorized or that cannot be qualified as safe. So it's important. There are STI like gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, cause even the hepatitis B and C as well as HIV we can, we can, we can spread. So an emphasis on safe sex is very, very important. And I just want to use this opportunity to encourage men, you know, to not allow that excitement that comes with you know intercourse to make them disregard the importance of practicing safe sex. Thank you so much, uh, Sabi Doctor. So, Doctor Nimasha, do you have any parting words for us as well before we take the final oh, well, poll? Well, all I would say is retinal dysfunction premature ejaculation, and orgasm. There are many sexual, um, dis, uh, sexual problems in men. And oftentimes because of our ego, and our, yeah, our ego most times, we don't own up to it. We don't want to come out um, to actually seek professional help. We think uh, 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 our information will be divulged or that will make us of our next of men. Our only, um, say that please do not suffer in silence. There's help, um, seek professional help. There are many urologists in Lagos, many urologists all over Nigeria and worldwide. And erectile dysfunction can actually, uh, most sexual problems in men can actually be uh, addressed and have significant improvement and satisfactory sexual relationship. Uh, okay. life, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Animasha. Uh, so we have a brief poll just to ask you some questions. Uh, 
and then basically to see how much of an impact this has had. And just as we are rounding off, um, while we're waiting for the result of the poll, it's a great time to talk about um, this platform that's enabled this entire webinar to be had and um, basically the conversations that we've been sparking around healthcare. So basically it's Dr. Connect said, we have a telemedicine application that basically means that you have a hospital on your phone once you have an app because with the app on your phone, if you go to the Play Store or App Store, depending on the device you use, you can easily download the app um, and you can book an appointment anytime, anywhere um, and any 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 time really. And the interesting part is you have access to all these doctors. You also have access to secondary care, which is access to specialist doctors as well. Um, on request basis, whenever you need to have one or two consultations with specialist doctors, you can easily get that. And then we also have a partner lab, um, Life Pro here in Alaosa, where you can walk in at any time to do whatever. I think the address will be dropped on the screen as well. And um, you can walk in at any time to do some of these tests. We have the healthy man test, which uh, has some of the tests that would expect a man to do from time to time. Um, also, we can also do um, some other screening tests and there's a wellness test that can be done. So basically with the wellness test, uh, you basically do a full body screen and it's available once a year, at least you do it, you understand the state of your body and all of that. So those are some of the things that we have ongoing at the moment. And that's the poll results are in. Uh, you can see that at least most of us know now that erectile dysfunction can be prevented and that you can talk to a doctor on our app about sexual health. So basically, I think the address has also been dropped on the chat section as well. So I think at this point, we'll call it a day. It's been wonderful being here with everyone and thank you for taking out time to come attend this session. Um, Thank you for taking out time to attend this session. Um, it's been amazing having you. And please don't forget to share with your friends because we would have, um, basically we would have the recording of this session, this webinar, we'll have the recording shared to everyone here and you can also share it with your friends. We'll have it also on our social media platforms. You can follow us on social media so you are tuned in for more engaging content and programs that will come in your way. Today we'll address men, tomorrow we'll address women, next tomorrow we'll address some other issues. So there are always so many issues to talk about when it comes to healthcare and we cannot exhaust it all. Um, we are passionate about ensuring that every Nigerian has access to quality and affordable healthcare. And that's what you're trying to do here. And part of it is also having access to that great information. So you know where to go when you have issues because if you don't know where to go when you have problems, then you won't even know how to find the solution to your problem. So the first step is doing where to go and we made that step easier. It's on your phone and you can basically download the app and get started right now. Don't forget if you want to talk to Dr. Anima Shao or any of uh, the urologists in our, within our network, you can definitely fill that form now, book an appointment with him. You can also do the healthy man test. You can do the erectile dysfunction, um, dysfunction screening test as well. On that form, you can click tick whatever you want to do and then you fill it. And then when you come in, you can have more conversations around whatever your concerns are.